One of the keys to fat loss is protein. It's true, if you're not eating a high protein diet, you're not gonna burn as much body fat as you can. So in today's episode, we're gonna talk about the smartest ways to use protein for fat burn and to build muscle. You gotta watch this. I wish I understood this earlier in my career. I think it was probably almost 10 years in when Same. I started to just focus on this with clients. I knew it was important, yeah. but I don't know how important. Yeah, I also did. I knew it was important, and I, but I also didn't understand um, just coaching to that, the simplicity of it and how much that would, like everything else would kind of fall into place, if that makes sense. Yeah, you yeah. literally have here a situation. So there's very few things like what I'm about to say when it comes to fat loss and muscle gain. There's very, very few things that you can... You can do one thing, take one step, and it have the effect of, let's say, the next 10 steps yeah. by itself. And that's uh, the effect that protein can have. Now, just to just to kind of set the context and the stage here, and they've done many studies on this, okay? A high-protein diet, even in the context of controlled calories, meaning you got two groups of people eating the same calories, okay? But one group is high-protein, the other one is low or moderate-protein. Even though they're the same calories, the high protein group always leads to more muscle and less body fat. In other words, eating more protein, even with the same calories, will result in more fat loss and more muscle gain, or at least muscle preservation. So it's extremely important because the the belief has been for a long time, or or maybe even the misunderstanding, that really it's about the calories. And so long as you hit your minimums. Does it make a difference if it's high protein, low protein, high carb, low carb, whatever? I remember a while ago when this was the discussion around carbs. Yeah. And it was, well, low carb will burn more body fat than high carb will, even if the calories are controlled. And the studies came out and actually showed that's that's not true. Not it's the true. same body fat. It's not the same with protein, though. With protein, a high protein diet uh, with the same calories is just more effective. It's just far more effective. There's also, too, uh, keeping in mind uh, behaviorally what – most people do when they when they go to get in shape. I mean, I just had this conversation with my brother-in-law. He's been following um, the whole series that I'm doing on YouTube, right? And this is a, a, what we're talking about today. It was it was a, is a big part of my early message. Like, just goal one: go hit protein intake. Just focus on that, right? Minimal dose inside the gym. Hit protein intake. Hit protein intake. That's yeah. all I'm focusing on right now. And watch how far I go. So he's like, call, he's calling me on like the third day of him watching this. And he's like, bro, he's like so hard to get that protein like yeah, that do i have to do that and i'm like well yeah no and you not only do you need to do it you need to consistently do it because it, it, it doesn't like it does your body doesn't store protein the way it does carbs and fat so it's like if you have one good day of protein say you even eat over a little bit and then the next day you have really low it doesn't really carry over, it doesn't really carry over like that <laughs> uh -oh. so it's like you then you're missing you're going back and say you need to think you're going backwards time. then you add it too and then i'm like what are you doing workout wise oh i have got this thing i'm like and then on top of that the, the overtraining. Mm -hmm. So not only, so you have to understand the way people, like when they're motivated to get in shape, they come with this uh, over application of intensity and volume and training. Guns blazing. And then they also lack hitting the protein. And the combination of the two of that is super detrimental. That's a, that's a recipe for, um, for disaster. So protein, high protein diet also, again, with calories being controlled, also leads to more muscle. And part of that, which I said earlier, part of that is that it leads to faster recovery. So it also makes you more resilient to stress. And, and remember, exercise is a stress. This is why strength training builds muscle. It's a stress on the body. Mm -hmm. The body adapts to stress by getting stronger so that it's no longer stress. Of course, you add weight to the bar, do more reps, whatever. But the, the, but the, the fact remains that a higher protein diet um, simply makes you more resilient. And then you you said something, Adam, uh, when, you're, when you were taught, I think it was you said your cousin, who said, oh, it's so hard to hit this protein. One of the reasons why it's so challenging is because a high protein diet crushes your appetite. Satiating. So Super when you look satiating. at, yeah, when you compare protein, fats, and carbohydrates in terms of its satiety effect, so like how full it makes you feel, especially in the first six months of your diet, a high protein diet, even at the same calories, will be perceived by your body as much, many, many more calories. Now, there's a lot of theories around this. Part of it, the, one of the theories is that protein in nature typically comes with a lot of nutrients. So when you hit your protein amounts, your body is like, we're getting plenty of nutrients. We don't need yes. to, we, need, we can dampen this hunger signal so you can focus on, on other things. That's one of the theories. But, but the fact remains, especially in those early days, a high protein diet is one of the most effective ways to, to control your appetite, which is extremely important for fat loss. 
if you can simply control your appetite, fat loss becomes 90% easier. I think we, we've all seen this now with the rise of these appetite-controlling uh, peptides like GLP-1s. Mm -hmm. One of the main reasons why they're effective is people don't want to eat. It just kills your appetite. Well, a high-protein diet will do that as well, and it's far more effective, not a little bit, it's far more effective at, at hammering your appetite um, than carbs and fats. Well, the reason why you're going to keep hearing us talk about this uh, pretty much indefinitely is because of that fact alone. Like Once people actually like go through the process of having to focus on acquiring as much protein as necessary for them for their daily intake, it's always surprising. It never will not be surprising that it's really an intentional pursuit. This is something that you have to like have train to your accident. way towards. Yeah, it's not like an accidental thing. You don't just like stumble into, you know, hitting those, those numbers. Um, and it is, it's, it's challenging because it's satiating. It's challenging, uh, because like there's, it's just to source, it's kind of challenging. Like you have to really like look where to go get the right type of, of protein. Uh, but even to your other point about like, you know, healing versus adapting, like it has that recover me element to it. If you're getting adequate amount of protein, you're actually now going to be adapting as opposed to just recovering from, you know, you're probably going to be overdoing it because you're so hyped about like your, your workouts. This episode is brought to you by one of our sponsors, Zero Shoes. These shoes were made for lifting. I love them. They've got a nice wide toe box, great for deadlifting. You can get some for squatting. They're great for muscle function of the foot, the ankle. They also look really good. Go check them out. In fact, right now, they're having a massive sale up to 70% off all shoes. Go check them out. Go to zeroshoes.com. That's X-E-R-O, shoes.com forward slash mind pump. All right, here comes the show. I yeah. want to I want to talk a little bit more about the theory that you mentioned, because I don't know if we've ever discussed that on here. Yeah. And that's super interesting to me that, um, is that the prevailing theory that yeah. the reason why uh, it is so satiety producing is that it's so nutrient dense and then it's sending a signal to the body like, oh, we're pretty good versus when I'm eating empty calories and you still want to have more or processed foods. Yeah. Like, hmm. Is that what they, is that what yeah, they. Yeah. So that, so there's this theory um, that your, your, your signals, your body has to prioritize the drivers that it has uh, that, that, that drive you for certain behaviors. Right. So you have the dry, you have the driver for, uh, for sex, for, you know, for thirst, hunger, for shelter and safety and those types of things. And so when you've met the demands of one of those drivers, then it, what it does is it, it takes away the resources from driving you to do this so that it, you could put it towards other things. For example, is this you like have, sweet uh, means safety. Uh, oh level? yeah. Well, so that's a little different. Uh, yeah. like something that's sweet in nature typically isn't, uh, poisonous. Uh, so that's something different, but uh, along those lines, like for example, your drive, your, your drive to procreate is very powerful. Well, if you're, if you're having a lot of sex, that drive will come down so that you can focus now on getting food. Another thing, same thing with hunger. So protein in nature, if you were to eat a, a, a lot of protein in a day, it meant you, you consumed, you definitely got your daily amount of fat and fat is essential. Carbohydrates are not essential. So really doesn't care if you get enough carbohydrates or not necessarily, yeah. unless your energy is too low maybe. Yeah. But you're also gonna get a lot of nutrients. Uh, meat, contrary to popular belief, this is totally false, the most nutrient dense foods on the planet are meat. Um, now I'm not suggesting you do this. I don't think this is a good idea. I don't think it's a good diet at all. But if you had to eat just one food and get away with that for the rest of your life with the lowest risk of nutrient deficiency and you can only pick one food, it would be meat, in particular mm -hmm. red meat. Yeah. Uh, you're probably not going to get a nutrient deficiency if you just ate red meat. Again, it's not ideal, but there are there, there's really no other food you could do that with. And it's because it's so nutrient dense. So that's the theory. The theory is if you're getting a lot of protein, the hunger signal comes way down. All right, cool. We got all the nutrients. So now I've, you can I've always wondered like how much truth there is to it because there's been times where like uh, – you know, uh, where I've had seen clients who actually like have cravings for foods when their body is deficient in it. Yeah. Like, you know, sometimes you'll see people that crave chocolate are deficient in iron yeah. or you have certain foods that they crave and it's, oh, because they don't have any healthy fats. Yeah, That's yeah. why you need your body was trying to tell yeah. you. And so I wonder how much truth is Pika to that. eating minerals. Yeah. That's yeah. when people eat paint. Yeah, yeah paint or like clay. When, yeah. Say what? With yeah, there's this, eating. There's this like disorder that uh, was it pregnant women? Uh -huh. they, pregnant. They, would, they would eat clay or paint. They couldn't figure out why. And yeah. There was a nutrient in there that they were lacking. Yeah, their body's just naturally yeah. craving. And they gravitate towards a certain yeah. thing or food or whatever. Yeah. So I mean, this this by the way, the, the the appetite crushing effects of protein. There's new data suggesting that this is really 
a, a phenomena that happens in those early days of a diet and it starts to kind of wane off a little bit later. Uh, I, in my experience with clients, it always has an effect, but I, I also agree with that study because initially it's hard. And, and, and to be honest, the time that you would want your appetite to be most controlled when you're trying to change your eating is in that first six month period when you're developing new behaviors. That's when you need the most help. It's not when you've already been eating healthy for a year or two. It's in those early stages. So the, you, if you're especially challenged in that first 90 days of really trying to eat right or whatever, like high protein is going to handle the appetite part better than anything else. And I think that's a, a massive, uh, massive win. It also leads to a faster metabolism. And there's two reasons for this. One is protein has a thermic effect that's higher than carbohydrates or fats. What does that mean? Well, to utilize the protein or to take the protein, break it down in amino acids, send it to the target tissues, that costs energy. And it costs more energy per calorie or per gram of, uh, I should say, per calorie of protein than it does per calorie of fats or carbohydrates. So it also burns more calories to consume more protein. And then the second part of that is because it leads to muscle, well, we know what that does to the metabolism. So, okay, faster metabolism, less, you know, more body fat loss, and you, and you control your appetite more. Like we're, we're now starting to talk about, and I hate to say this, but like a magic mac macronutrient. So it's very important uh, thing to focus on. Yeah, I think the most important piece is the, what I was – alluding to with people when they first get started that don't focus on protein and they in a reintroduce either cardio or strength training and just the role that it plays in building muscle and building your metabolism. Mm -hmm. It is so crucial that it, you can't just simply go exercise or lift weights and expect it to do all the work. If you don't give it the building blocks that it needs to support that, right. then you end up spinning your wheels and you're doing all this extra work that you're and not getting the return on it. Or you think you're doing good because you cut calories, you're moving like crazy, and the scale does, goes down four or five pounds. But in reality, you lost as much, much muscle as you did fat. In my experience, now the data shows something like 50% uh, to twice as much muscle gain uh, with high protein versus, let's say, your, your typical you know protein diet. Um, and by the way, high protein. When we keep saying high protein, we're referring to about a gram of protein per pound of body weight or per pound of, of target body weight. So whatever you want to weigh, that's what you eat in grams of protein. So when we say high protein, if you Google high protein, you're gonna get you're gonna get a low protein version from the FDA that says you know anything over 60 grams or whatever. That's that's not what we're talking about. The studies that we're referring to, and there's a lot of them, it's not one, there's a lot of studies, this is pretty pretty established, is a, is close to about a gram of protein uh, per pound of body weight. So that's what you want to aim for, and it, it, it builds more muscle to the tune of uh, about 50% more, some twice as much. In my experience, especially with the clients that had such low protein diets when I got them, like there were some female clients that, that would work with me, and they were eating like 50 grams a day. Like, you know, like super low protein. I'd get them to go from 50 to 120 grams of protein a day, 130 grams of protein a day. They would build th like three times as much muscle. It wasn't even in the same ballpark. So it was just to back you up. Yeah. The strength training was the same. Right. But like, it was almost like three times as much progress as what we would expect. What What about like uh, um, the quality of protein, the types of protein? Like uh, uh, how, how much of a role does that play? Like if I was somebody who all I had was you know, plant proteins versus, uh, you know, meat, or what if I did, um, you know, grain fed beef instead of grass fed yeah. beef, like how important is the type of protein that I'm eating? So it's when we're talking specifically about protein, animal sources, um, are the best, the highest quality. Now the quality of protein is there's a few different ways to rate quality of protein. Uh, but I, I, I'd say that they all kind of center around how much the protein is assimilated and used and how, uh, how, how it leads to muscle protein synthesis or positive protein synthesis. Okay. So in other words, if you eat a gram of this kind of protein versus that kind of protein, how much are they going to contribute to the repair process and build process yeah. in the body? And the ones that rank the highest are egg, you know, beef, chicken, fish, uh, milk, you know, whey protein is way up there. Egg protein is way up there. Um, animal sources are just the best. Um, in, in the head-to-head -head competition with all vegan sources, they're just superior. Now, you could get such a high-protein diet that doesn't matter. So if you're above a gram of protein per pound of body weight, it doesn't make a big difference where it's coming from. But I will say this, in my experience, a really high vegan 
protein diet does tend to lead more often to, to gastrointestinal dis distress and gut issues because the protein doesn't seem to be as easily to, uh, as easy to uh, to break uh, down. Yeah. But it's the animal sources uh, are superior. And then you mentioned grass fed versus grain fed. The protein in there is the same. It's the same amino acid breakdown, but grass fed meat is higher in omega threes and a type of fat called uh, CLA, conjugated linoleic acid. In the in the, in the context of the same calorie, same fat content, but one cal one diet is higher in CLA and omega threes in the other. Higher CLA and higher omega three content builds more muscle and burns more body fat as well. In fact, they used to sell. CLA is a fat loss supplement. I remember. Do you remember that? Yeah, Where you, yeah, would, yeah. you would buy them in capsules because the data showed that, you know, if these two diets are identical, this one's high in CLA, this one isn't, the high CLA diet is going to burn more fat. Now, of course, the supplements were stupid because people were just adding it to the diet. So they're just adding calories <laughs> of extra CLAs. They weren't replacing any. Um, so yeah, grass-fed meat is going to, and you know, grass-fed meat is also higher in protein per ounce. So if you're trying to control your appetite, eat a lower calorie diet, like, you know, an eight ounce grass fed ribeye is less calories and more protein than an eight ounce grain fed, you know, uh, ribeye. Attention trainers and fitness fanatics on November 12th at 4 p.m., Adam and I are teaching a webinar for personal trainers in particular, how you can keep your clients during the holiday season. It's a free class. It's totally free. We're going to teach it. If you're interested, click on this link. What, um, what was the, what's our, uh, forget the name of the girl and she works for the glucose monitor company. We've had her on the show at oh, least. Oh yeah. NutriSense. What's her with name? Emily. Was her name no. Emily? Is that so? I don't want to, uh, was it Kara? Does it sound it right? It is Kara. It is Kara. She brought up something that I thought was interesting. I remember when she came on the show, it was one of the, I think it was the first time she came on about, uh, how important like starting your day with protein was yes. just what it did to like, uh, balancing your blood sugar and insulin and stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, so she, represents NutriSense. And this is a company that uses uh, continual glucose monitors um, along with nutrition coaches. And so a continual glucose monitor, you wear it on your arm. There's a tiny, tiny little needle in there. It's like a literally like a, like a hair. You don't even feel it. it kind of goes in your arm a little bit. And what it does is it reads your blood sugar in real time and it, and it uses an app on your phone. So you could see, oh, I ate that meal. My blood sugar did this. You know, I lost sleep. I'm stressed, whatever. How all those things affect your blood sugar. And so we had her on the show and I asked her, what is one of the most impactful things on maintaining nice, consistent blood sugar, avoiding the super high spikes and the super low drops, or if you do get a high spike that you balance out real nicely, like what are the things that impact blood sugar in the most positive ways? And, and by the way, that's important because maintaining good, stable blood sugar, aside from, you know, being a contributor to good health and helping prevent things like diabetes and stuff like that in the future, it also positively affects your behaviors because the big spikes and drops can make you feel anxious and hungry. It gives you cravings. So when your blood sugar is controlled, this is why people made a big deal out of the glycemic index back in the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that when you're eating, uh, when you're maintaining good blood sugar, you're less likely to overeat. You're more likely to, to, to have a more controlled appetite. You're going to have better energy. You just feel better overall and you make better choices. So I asked her the question. And the first thing she said was strength train. Strength training for sure has a, a profound impact on, on blood sugar. We all know this. And then diet-wise, she said, eat a high-protein breakfast. Mm. If you eat a high-protein breakfast, it, no matter what else you eat throughout the day, yeah. your blood sugar will be better simply because of the high-protein breakfast. It tampers it down. Yeah, it's pretty crazy how that, that, that plays out, but keeping it balanced from the highs and the lows like that, just starting that one hack, it's pretty pretty cool. Totally. And, and I hate when the the our science nerdy friends uh, – try and make the argument of how uh, how that doesn't matter. If calories are equal, then it doesn't matter. And, and the, why I don't like that is, yeah, in the context of a study where everyone's controlled and they have to eat exactly what you tell them to eat, you're right, it doesn't make a difference, but we don't live in a, in a box like that. And then what we deal with is real people with real habits, bad habits and behaviors and influence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Cravings. and if you can do things to help your client make better choices makes it easier it makes it easier for them you know another example of that that we've seen before is <clears throat> and if someone gets a real bad night of sleep like they need to be mentally prepared that that next day they're going to be craving bad foods yep. and just to be on top of that and be able become aware of it yes you're right if they still eat the same amount of their calorie deficit as a day when they didn't get good sleep then theoretically they should burn as much body fat but 
it doesn't always work that mm -hmm. way and it's they're they're battling that and so it's really unfortunate that some of the information that's came out around the the glucose monitors and and insulin and blood sugar people have made like oh well it doesn't matter in the context of no it matters Cal yeah it does it's, it's stupid because uh if you have two people locked in a, in a room and they only could eat what you fed them and it doesn't matter how you feel i don't care how you feel if you're hungry you're only gonna eat what i give you what matters more the most with people is how they feel yeah. that matters more than anything because your feelings, your appetite, that dictates your behaviors, and you're a free human walking around. I mean, do you how much okay, how much easier is it gonna be to eat healthy when you want to versus when you don't want to, right? right. And so maintaining good blood sugar helps do that. There's other things that help with that as well, but that's one of them. And so simply eating a high protein breakfast could have that uh, that kind of an impact. By the way, it's also important to do that because we we're we've already made the case that eating a high protein diet regardless of your goal and calories is going to help you with fat loss and muscle gain. You know how hard it is to eat the one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Extremely if you don't hard. eat a high protein breakfast, yeah, like you're, you're behind, like if you're, let's say you're a woman and your, your target body weight is let's say 140 pounds. That's probably a good average healthy body weight. You know, some women are taller, shorter, but let's say 140 pounds. That's 140 grams of protein a day. Let's say your breakfast had 10 grams of protein. Good luck. Yeah. Trying to hit 140 now with lunch and dinner. You need 70 grams of protein yeah. for not, lunch and dinner. Not you, happening. No, would it help? What is that? 12 ounces, you know, of uh, 12 ounces of meat yeah. more. Yeah. So that person, 140 grams, would need to start with at least at least 40 grams of protein for breakfast, so that it's realistic to eat more protein throughout the day. Right. Um, so that's the other part of it is you know start the day off with a high protein meal to control blood sugar and because you just won't be able to hit your, your number. And not just starting the day, but even starting every single time you eat. I mean, I talked about this in the series that I went that I really didn't overcomplicate or even overthink the other foods that I was eating. It was just like, I was gonna, when I'm hungry, I'm gonna eat. And yeah. when I eat, I'm gonna make it protein centric and eat the protein first. Yes. And honestly, the, the, my, the way I felt took care of the rest. Like it really, if I just kept going after the protein first uh, in all my meals and eating it first, then if I was even hungry, I'd eat a little bit of the carbs or fat yeah. afterwards, yeah. and then I, and then I'd be fine. It was like, and I remember when I figured this out for clients, where it we wouldn't tell them anymore that oh you can't have this or you can only eat this way. I was like, no, here's what I want you to do. You're just going to focus on protein. Start your day off right. Every meal, make sure it's got a minimum of 35 to 50 grams of protein in it. Eat it first and then mm -hmm. enjoy this stuff later. And they'd always look back, well, wait a second. Well, how much carbs and how much fat? It's like, we'll get there. You don't need to worry about that right now. If you just wa watch what happens, if you just do that, it's amazing. Yeah, when you're looking at your plate, there there is a uh, a a priority of, of order of things you should eat in terms of what's going to give you the most nutrients, give you the most benefits, whatever. If you eat the protein first, you're going to hit, you're going to hit that because protein typically comes with some fats. Now you have your essential fats with you. The protein is important for fat loss, muscle gain, appetite control. And then afterwards, if you want to have the, the, some of the carbohydrates and fibers, that's totally fine, but you start with it first and it tends to lead to better eating behaviors. It tends to lead to more appropriate, uh, caloric intake. Which takes us to another part of this, which is protein shakes. A lot of people are like, okay, cool. You're telling me to eat high protein. Um, I'm going to use shakes all the time. You can do that, um, but a lot of the benefits that we're talking about from a behavioral standpoint, um, where, you, where your appetite is more controlled, you feel more full, you feel better, all that stuff, even insulin control, it's better with whole food sources of protein. Now, protein shakes can be valuable, at the end of the day, in my opinion, if you're at the end of the day and you missed your target by 30 grams, 40 grams, 50 grams, 20 grams, now you have your shake, boom, you hit your target. In, in my opinion, I think that's the best way to, sh to use it. I mean, I always it. taught clients and I hold myself to the same accountability. And by the way, during this whole process that I was going through this, um, I absolutely had to use shakes almost every single day. But I don't score that as a perfect day. Like I would tell clients, like that would ask me, so can I use a shake or can I use a bar? Absolutely. If that if that is convenient for you or you're behind on it at the end of the day, then absolutely. You like if you're eight o'clock, you're about to go to bed, you realize you're under your protein intake, and you're like, you know what, I could go pound that thirty gram shake of protein. Should I do it or not? Go do it. That's what I would tell a client. But it, but at the same time we're always working towards this goal of, can I get it all through Whole Foods? Mm -hmm. That's the way I would communicate it always. Is It's an incredible resource and tool to have shakes and bars by your side as an option or an alternative to a, a, a lesser choice. But the goal is always to be trying to target and get all this from Whole Foods. 100%. And then essential amino acid supplements 
are different than protein, uh, but they can be very valuable. So essential amino acids are the amino acids in protein that your body can't synthesize. And there is some value to supplementing with them if your protein sources are vegan uh, or vegan, right? So if you, like we said earlier, the animal sources are superior, well, one way you can kind of make up the difference is if you're getting your protein from vegan sources, you're like, look, I heard animal sources are better. You can drink essential amino acids or take those throughout the day, and that will raise the score mm -hmm. of your vegan sources of protein. Vegans tend to value or tend to benefit more from essential amino acid supplement than than omnivores. And so, what I used to do with my clients is I would have them take some essential amino acids with every meal, or later when they started making them into drinks, you know, powders that you could just drink. I told them to just drink them throughout the day, and they always notice benefits. Uh, my omnivores. Sometimes but my vegans was like, it was obvious. They would supplement with essential amino acids and they would always notice. Yeah, it's so benefit. difficult to get that number up and to add that extra bit of bump without a lot of the calories attached to it as well is, is super helpful for vegans. And well, it, it's tough because I'm using, I'm using a, you know, an anecdotal situation with me going through this and utilizing the EAAs. But it is interesting to me that this is the first time in my life that I was consistent with using EAAs before. And in this process, at least 50%, if not more than half the time, I missed my target of protein. But yet I was, if I did- But you're even chasing it too. Yeah, and exactly. That was me going after it, still missing it. Yeah. And then because of that, I was su supplementing daily with EAAs. Now the end result was I lost five pounds of fat and I built 18 pounds of muscle. It's hard to say what would have happened had I just like yeah. only did it and I didn't utilize the also the EAAs. Be really interesting. I to think see the what that more was. more important thing mm -hmm. to focus on. Forget the how much more it helped. It definitely helped because fifty percent of the time you couldn't hit those targets. That's what I'm saying. So for sure, help. We don't know how much, but it would be different if you were hitting your targets every day, and then you added them. Then we it would be a question. No, totally. And that's kind of how I treated it. it was like the, again, the goal was to not have to take it. With the goal was to get plenty of it through Whole Foods. Yeah. But the reality was. I was still missing even going after it, which is why like having a topic like this and stressing this, it's like, uh, it's so crazy how often I have to continue to, to remind people and tell me it's that big of a game changer to be consistent with this. Yeah. And everybody who thinks they eat enough protein because they, they like meat or they start every day with some sort of, a, and so they think they eat a lot. Very rarely do I assess someone's diet and then come back and be like, Hey, you're eating plenty of protein. That almost never happens. That'd be rare. Hey, sorry to interrupt. It's October. MAPS Muscle Mommy is 50% off, half off. If you're interested, click on the link below. All right, back to the show. Got some questions here. First one, what are some great high-quality uh, protein snacks? Oh, I mean- Beef jerky? Yeah, beef jerky is the yeah, king. Yeah, that's great. It's got high shelf life. You can buy it at the gas station. It's, it's, I mean, it's a good source of protein. The other thing I would say is if you could tolerate dairy, yeah, like Greek, I, Greek yogurt. I mean, I, Greek yogurt, cottage cheese. Like, so, I mean, cottage cheese used to be like bodybuilder staple food. Mm -hmm. You go to the grocery store, you get yourself, and you can go lower calorie, higher calorie. Like a little tub of that's like 30 grams of high they, quality protein. They, yeah, they actually make now a lot of these brands, Chobani, uh, Okios, uh, they make them like, in, I don't know if they infuse it with whey also or not, mm. but they're like high protein. So I have these little, small, little servings of Greek yogurt that have 15 grams a shot, and I do two of those, and it's still Ooh, like- 30 grams. Easy, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Easy to, to slam yeah. down. And I, that's probably, if, if it's not beef jerky, I'd say Greek yogurt. It's like my go-to, like quick, easy snack. Yeah, the other thing would be like tuna fish. I know that's a little yeah. bit less convenient, yeah. but you, know, you could get that out of the can and, and, and eat that, too, if you don't mind the fish. Next question. Is there any benefit to eating more than one gram of protein per pound of body weight? You know what is interesting about that? Not always, but probably with a lower calorie diet. So if you're somebody who's in a calorie deficit and you're pushing lower calories, there's probably benefit to going higher in protein. And I say probably because it's mixed. Now, in my experience, uh, when I've had clients go high protein, it's it's more impactful for the people. It's more important, I should say, for people. In when I had people in deficits, it was like, you better, you have to hit your protein. Yeah. People who are in a calorie surplus, mode. it wasn't as important. And, and the data does show that in a higher calorie context, carbohydrates, even fats can be what's called protein sparing. But if your calories are below what you're burning, so you're losing body fat, um, you, you, you 
probably would benefit from going a little higher protein. I mean, I almost always will push clients there or above. It's, yeah. I mean, because it, it's also, it's so long as digestion is okay, it's definitely not going to hurt you. No. So, and if I have a choice to bump somebody in calories, I would rather bump in protein anyways with somebody just because of that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I'm always pro them doing that. Different story if you're complaining and you have issues digesting that much protein. Uh, then I would talk uh, about how that may not be beneficial to you, but most people would benefit for at least one gram or more. Next question. How often can I use a protein shake? Oh, I mean, as often as you want. <laughs> but I, 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 I used to really, when I would advise clients on this, my goal with them was to not have to use protein shakes, but if they had to, one a day. I mean, if you're using more than one shake a day, one serving a day, um, it's it, you're you're missing out on all the value of whole foods, and, and I don't think you're developing the relationship with food that has it's, it's long term. In my experience, right? In my mm -hmm. experience, yeah. If I'm trying to help you develop a nice long term consistent uh, behavior around food, then it should be mostly centered uh, around uh, real food and not shakes. If if two of your meals or two, you know two of your servings of protein are coming from two shakes, unless you're like one of those really big you know, bodybuilders, you know, consuming 240 grams of protein, 250 grams of protein, in which case I get, you know, two servings. But most people, it's like at the most one. It, to me, it was just so simple to, okay, if we scored ourselves every day on how well did you sleep is a score, how well did you eat today is a score, how well did you train today is a score. If I was scoring the way I ate, and I ate absolutely perfect, hit my macros, ate everything perfect, but I needed a shake in order to get there, it was a nine, it wasn't a 10. If I did it through all whole foods, it was a 10. It was that simple. Yeah. It's like still really good. If you eat, hit your macros and you use a shake to get there, that's still a really good day of eating, but it's not perfect. And I'm always trying to be better. Just like if I were to score my sleep at a night and go, well, I did really good last night. I had pretty good sleep, but I was on my phone a little bit longer than I should have, or I was doing this stuff. I got a nine. I still have room to be better. So it's kind of how I coach clients is that Listen, it is definitely uh, better than you not, and you would have scored an eight or a seven had you missed that. So, yeah, better to have the shake, but it's not a perfect day. No. Perfect day, we get it all through Whole Foods. Now, anecdotally, I've done both, where I have a shake every day or I'm just eating whole food. And uh, anecdotally, when everything seems to be the same, I just do better with well, whole food. I, just, I, told I seem you, to look different. I seem to get better results. I did a whole show where you have a you had even more down to the. To, I, I yeah. did. So I had a whole. I had two different shows that I compared this with. It was interesting. And I, I what unfortunately I can't tell you. Can't, I can't explain the science of why. But I definitely uh, got leaner, looked better, felt better. Uh, didn't battle as much cravings. I noticed more cravings when I was doing shakes and bars. You're still processed, you know, hyper palatable uh, process. Right. And I had way it. less of that. Um, when I was doing it all through whole foods, uh, and exactly all macros, everything controlled one, one show that I got ready for, uh, I allowed as much shakes and bars as I wanted. And another one, I did nothing but whole foods. And there was a difference. There was, I've just, I felt like I came in sharper with the food. I felt like I didn't have as many of the cravings. Uh, why, how, I can't explain to you it. But I again, it just goes back to why the goal is to try and do it all through Whole Foods. That's a perfect day, but it doesn't mean it's bad if you have a shake or a bar. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible but not if you guess along the way. So we're gonna talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range, right? Of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher. Body